Here's a simulation of what it looks like when a satellite dies, when it literally rips itself apart as it screeches towards Earth. Some of it vaporizes, just disintegrates into thin air. And the whole thing leaves behind a fiery, glowing trail of ash, plasma, and light. And this actually looks pretty cool from our point of view on Earth. It looks like a meteor or a shooting star, but the whole thing is actually incredibly violent and it's happening a lot more than ever before to the point where now some scientists are asking if we don't slow down, could these explosive re-entries actually be thinning our planet's ozone layer, the layer that protects us from the full onslaught of the sun's cancer-causing UV rays, and the layer that humanity has worked so hard to repair over the last few decades. Let me explain the science. There are close to 10,000 satellites orbiting the Earth right now. More than half of them are Starlink satellites. These are what the newest ones look like pretty huge, about the size of a pickup truck. And they last around five years before sputtering out. When they die, it's too expensive to, you know, like push them out of Earth's gravity into outer space. So instead they come back to Earth in such a way that they just burn up completely. That means that that mass, right, the mass of metals and computers and solar panels, right, everything on the satellite gets melted and added to uh, the upper atmosphere. That last part is the important part. Everything on the satellite gets melted and added to the upper atmosphere. All of that metal has to go somewhere. It doesn't just disappear. In this case, these satellites have a ton of aluminum in them. And what happens when you vaporize aluminum? It reacts with oxygen to create aluminum oxide, which is uh, whatever, it's fine. Aluminum oxide itself isn't really a problem, except it's a catalyst for another reaction. Its surface uniquely provides a kind of platter for other elements floating up there to settle on and then to mix. So two compounds in particular that you will find in our stratosphere, there's hydrogen chloride, but you'll also find chlorine nitrate, uh, which is CLON. O2. And when those compounds, you know, settle on this aluminum oxide surface and then react with each other, the result, you get two things out of it. That's chlorine gas, and you also get nitric acid, HNO3. Why do we care about that? Well, because uh, here, <laughs> you're setting chlorine atoms free, and pure chlorine is super reactive. If you think about it like little chlorine soldiers, about 90% are sitting back in the reserves in a pretty inert form. Just a bunch of chill compounds that don't do anything. But the other 10% are out there on the front lines. They're looking for a fight and aluminum oxide pushes some of those reserve soldiers into active duty. So it's really about taking the chlorine that's up there uh, and moving it in from one form into another form. And it's these more energetic forms of chlorine, like atomic chlorine, that are, that are very reactive towards ozone. And this is where we come to the central problem. When pure chlorine comes into contact with an ozone molecule, O3, our ozone layer, it reacts with it by stealing one of the oxygen atoms away. So you end up with chlorine monoxide plus oxygen gas. That has the effect of destroying the ozone molecule, which then just kind of turns into that. That's not great. We need the ozone layer. But here's where it gets worse, because that chlorine soldier isn't done yet. Uh, chlorine and oxygen, you know, they, they get along just fine. But when that oxygen finds another oxygen, of which there are Plenty, right? He'd rather bond with that instead. So you end up with this chlorine all alone once again. This kind of chain reaction means that one chlorine atom alone can destroy up to 100,000 ozone molecules by inserting itself 
causing a reaction where it pulls that oxygen away, leaving O2, oxygen gas, behind. And then when another oxygen comes in, that chlorine is free to bounce, only to do that again and again and again. And it happens with such speed that our thin layer of ozone, O3, it can't regenerate fast enough. So ozone is, um, it blocks the highest energy light from the sun. Higher energy light causes cancer, right? Like it causes mutations in your cells. So you don't want a lot of, of high energy light, right? You get sunburns, eventually you get cancer, right? So protecting the ozone layer protects human health on the ground. You know how we know all of this? Well, because it's happened before. In fact, how do you think all that chlorine got up there in the first place? If you're my age, you remember the campaign to save the Earth's ozone layer. A recent report concluded that this layer is thinning rapidly. Almost everyone in the industrialized world shares some part of the blame. It was a big deal because it was a really big problem. In the 1980s, scientists discovered there was a hole in our ozone layer and it was growing. And if we didn't fix it, they predicted this could cause millions of new cases of cataracts and cancer. The protective layer is down. For example, this week, it's 17% below normal. And this is what happens to some people exposed to UV rays, skin cancer. Eventually, scientists figured out what the problem was. Chemicals in some of our everyday items, like refrigerators, air conditioners, aerosols, plastic foam insulation, they were rising up into the stratosphere. You've probably heard of them. CFCs. 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 CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. And yes, that first C is chlorine. What would happen is you'd get these CFC compounds wafting around and, you know, they're exceptionally hard to break down. They don't really break down until over a period of years, they go so high up into the sky and closer to the sun when the sun's UV rays break it down. Specifically, that chlorine soldier breaks free and starts ripping the ozone layer apart. As soon as we stopped putting those CFCs into the atmosphere, the ozone layer started to heal. Human action to save the ozone layer appears to have worked. That was honestly probably the biggest international uh, climate success story to date. But all that chlorine is still up there, just waiting for something like aluminum oxide from a satellite to come along and make it angry. Okay, so you might be thinking, there have been satellites circling around us for more than half a century. Why all the worry about our ozone layer now? Well, just look how many objects humanity has launched into space every year over the last few years. There's been more satellites launched in the last five years than throughout the rest of the entire uh, history of, of using space. Starlink is the main player in this game. They've already sent around 6,000 satellites up that are now circling around in low orbit, and almost every day they're launching more. Three, two, one, ignition. And Starlink's end goal is to provide reliable internet access to, well, everyone, even the most remote corners of the Earth. And in order to do that, they need to create a bunch of mega constellations, essentially big clusters of these satellites, all interacting with each other, orbiting around Earth at a relatively low altitude. 42,000 satellites every five years is what they figure they'll need to pull this off. If you just do an average, that's an average of 23 satellites per day, almost one satellite per hour. So this is a huge amount of metal mass that is going to be added to um, to the Earth's upper atmosphere. And then uh, Amazon is going to have their own uh, satellite constellation. And then there's other companies like or, uh, like OneWeb. The number of satellites is going up dramatically. Now, what's the eventual impact of all those satellites on our ozone layer, given what we know? Well. Scientists have actually tried to model that out. They found we could see a 650% increase in aluminum oxide in our stratosphere. And Starlink satellites in particular, they're designed to burn up in a very complete way. So you don't get big chunks of aluminum crashing down into the ocean. It's all vaporizing. 
And the concern is even a small reduction in the integrity of our ozone layer can create serious problems. The ozone depletion we've seen since the 1980s is about is about in the order of about 3%. And, and that's had you know, very significant impacts on the incidence of skin cancer and cataracts. This recent study is an important reminder that just because we dealt with that huge threat to the ozone layer doesn't mean we'll never create additional threats to the ozone layer. Now, there is one caveat here. These scientists are only making well-informed guesses about how much aluminum these satellites actually contain. One thing that really frustrates me about my, my work with um, satellite operators is they consider all of the information about their satellites to be proprietary, and it's really hard to get them to share anything with the scientific community, right? So, like, if I, you know, email SpaceX and ask, hey, I want to know what your satellites are made of so I can find out what kind of chemical reactions might happen, uh, they're not going to tell me. Based on the high levels of aluminum they've recently found up there in the stratosphere, they estimate these satellites are about 30% aluminum. But again, that's just an estimate. Private companies are, are moving very, very quickly um, and regulation by uh, national and international governments has just, it's just so far behind, right? Um, this is that, you know, that Silicon Valley mentality of move fast and break things. This is a terrible place to move fast and break things. So do we know the exact consequence of tens of thousands of satellites burning up in our atmosphere? No, because there are just too many unknown variables. There's also the possibility that these satellites, you know, on a planetary scale, may not be the thing that rips our ozone layer wide open. But the question scientists are asking, do we really want to find out firsthand?